Episode 4, The Sons of Clotal. By now, we're in danger of getting repetitive with these fatricidial siblings. By this time, I'm going to split these wars into two parts. One is going to focus around the beginning of these wars, and the next episode will detail the middle, and then the third episode, the end. Now, the middle part will be the most interesting, as it details the entry of two women who would come to dominate the rest of the wars until their ends. When we last left off, Kotal had, in his will, split the kingdom again into four. The various parts are essentially the same kingdoms gifted to Clavis' sons, with a few minor changes, namely that of Calibal, the eldest son, receiving the kingdom of Shildabal, with his territories going from the Somme around Orléans Bolge into the Pyrenees, and into the area of Van in Bretagne. His capital was Paris, which is also the name given to his kingdom. The next brother was Gontran, who received Bourgogne, and who had Orléans as the center of his kingdom. The third brother, Sigebel received the kingdom of Remet slash Rheim in the northeast, while Chilperic got a tiny little slice that is almost pathetic in size in comparison to those of his brothers, with it comprising the area from the North Sea through Tilnai to Soissons, which was as far south as the realm went. These reigns began with the burial of Clotel and Soissons in the Basilique de saint médard We'll start with the eldest brother again and work our way down. Already 40 years old, the king of Paris, Calibal, was to encounter an immediate problem, one that would dominate the rest of his reign and the reigns of many kings long after him, that of fathering sons. Now, whether or not you want to believe that this law had any influence on, on the politics of this era or it was a forgery a thousand years later is irrelevant. The idea of women inheriting a crown was abhorrent in their eyes, as monarchs had to be robust warriors, capable of killing their foes and defending their children, or so went the traditional thought of the era. For these reasons, Caribal needed an heir, a serial monogamist who wed often and took several concubines one after the other, his first wife being Asia Balge, who was mother to a stillborn boy and three daughters, the eldest of whom Belf came of age around this time, likely between 13 and 16 years old during the reign of her father, who wed her to the Anglo-Saxon Ethelbert, king of Kent, and the first reference of a union between an English royal family of sorts and one from what we now call France. Caribel during his reign would head up a concile, or ecclesiastical council, with him encountering much difficulty from his clergy over the subject of his marriages, and would even be excommunicated for incest and sacrilege by the bishop of Paris, in what is also the first recorded use of excommunication against a monarch of Francia. In this era, being condemned to purgatory or hell was a grievous fret, and something the superstitious Malavangian could not endure. Therefore, Calibal recanted and remarried for the fourth time, this time to a more appropriate bride. His marriages did him no good, as he died in 567 on Mouse V at 50 years old, with his daughter's rights ignored in favor of his brothers who took a year to negotiate an agreement and properly divide up his land between them. As it is impossible to properly describe this newest division in precise details and words, I have included the map of 568 in the description of today's episode. The next brother was where his elder brother tended to be more distracted by increasing desperation for sons, Gontran was a much more laid-back individual, and one who, oddly for the male of Angier, seemed to genuinely love his brothers. According to Grigal, our main source of the era, he began his career under his father rather similarly to the likes of Chipelic, that is to say that he was violent. He also was a prolific ladies' man, like his elder brother, with him having a son by one wife, only to take on a concubine, who was the daughter of one of his nobles. This concubine soon had her own son, and desirous to claim the whole of Gontran's lands for her son, she had his first child poisoned. In turn, she apparently soon lost her own infant. Full of anger at this, when he found out, Gontran sent her away, with this concubine dying quietly. Whether he had her killed is very likely, if impossible to say for certain. He then took up with two other women and fathered two more sons, who would take on the names of Clotel and Clodomil. Full of remorse for his earlier intemperate life, and likely full of grief for the loss of his sons and elder brother, Gontran would become a changed man. The mediator between his brothers, he would seek to reconcile them several times, and even try to govern according to Christian ideals. That is to say, by taking care of the sick, protecting the innocent, and being generous with his wealth in times of plague and famine. So good was he a character, apparently, he was named a saint in time, becoming Saint Gontran, the first, though not the last, king of Francia to be canonized. He also built magnificent churches and monasteries as proof of his faith. When his brother, Caribal, died, the man's widow offered herself to Contran, 
but as this would have broken Christian traditions regarding incest and wedding one sibling's widow, he instead housed the unwilling former queen in a monastery. In 573, Gontran was lured into a civil war by Shibelic against Sigebel, a mistake he soon sought to atone for when he saw how cruelly his brother was ravaging Sigebel's kingdom. Switching sides, he pushed back Shibelic and would remain a firm protector and ally of his younger brother, Sigebel, and his family for the next two years until Sigebel passed away in 575. Upon his assassination, Shibelic would again seek to invade his lands. This time, though, Gontran had a secret weapon, namely that of Mumolu, the greatest general of the period who would push back Shilpilic and his own general without too much difficulty. Gontran's history of loyalty would continue even after his two sons died of dysentery in 577, with him nominating Sigebel's son Shildebel Dur as his heir and adoptive son, a position that one would think would guarantee Shildebel's loyalty towards his saintly uncle and patron. However, in 501, after Shilpilic marched on the southern part of Gontran's realm and took up many of his cities for himself, seeing this, Shildebel Dur in 585 switched sides and attacked Gontran, who, hurt and outraged by this betrayal, did the only thing he could under the circumstances. He made peace with his younger brother and turned on Childebel, reclaiming much of his kingdom in the process, sending his nephew packing, so to speak, towards his own lands. But this wasn't enough, as Gontran invaded Toul and Poitiers, claiming the cities there and taking them from Childebel, who could do nothing to stop him. The war was put on hold when, always the good Christian, Gontran doubled back in order to first see to the safety and baptism of his brother's heir, as his brother had passed away at this time, with this new infant king being named Clotel Dur. But Gontran was soon back to war. Before we leave the fascinating Gontran, I would like to tell you about one last interesting incident one that took place in either 584 or 585. A conspiracy that had been building up for several years exploded into action, as a miller's son by the name of Palomé, or Gondovald, seized a chunk of the kingdom of Nestri, that is to say, the heartland of the original Merovingien in Soissons and Tolnay, and founded the kingdom of Aquitaine, or Septimani. I won't go into too many details, but needless to say, it is a long and complicated affair so I'll do my best to summarize it, even as I encourage everyone to try to study the incident in greater details for themselves, as too many historians skip over it entirely, preferring the feud between the two ladies of the era to this interesting attempt to unseat the Malvangian line by a small clutch of nobles. Having the backing of many nobles, many of whom resented answering to the oftentimes distant and frequently preoccupied Malvangian in the north, and with the support of a palace mal, a kind of chief minister, what made the situation even worse was how Mimolu, the finest general of the age, who had previously defeated Chilpéric and even quashed several Lombal incursions into Provence in the southeast of Francia, near the Italian border, defected. Because of his defection, Bosson and Palomer would have many early successes against Gontran, whom was pushed back almost completely out of the south. Things would start to unravel, though, for the rebellion after it had encountered that much success against him. It could not maintain itself due to the perfidious nature of its own founders once things began to go awry. This defection on the part of Mumolu was not to last, as he soon returned suitably chastened after a short period of time. He soon proved his worth, though, as he tried to lay waste to the army of the true head behind the rebellion, the Duke Gontran Basson, that was at sea, by sabotaging his boats. He failed, so Mimolu fled to Avignon, where Basson laid siege to him. Mimolu, in turn, diverted the Rhone rivers from the moat, and after digging holes in the aforementioned moat, made it impossible for the opposing army to cross it. Childebel Dur soon sent a rescue force, one which duly saved the general. Fleeing to another city, Basson joined Palomel, who was soon under siege, with a group of nobles soon contacted by the Malvangian and convinced to open the city gates and turn upon the pretender, who was executed by many a javelin thrown by the Malvangian warriors, before they tied a rope to his feet and dragged him back to their camp where they punished his corpse by having his hair and beard literally torn off, only to leave it there. As to the other traitors, both those who had returned to the Malvangian side and those who refused to submit were all soon slaughtered with equal intensity. There is more to Gontran's career, but we'll touch on this later, next time. For now, we'll turn our attention to Sigebel, the third son of Clotel. His most notable achievement thus far has been to depend upon Gontran's kindness and protection. However, his truly most notable achievement politically was his marriage to a lady by the name of Brunho. With that said, Sigebel would be guilty of utilizing foreign elements in his army and losing control of them in his war of Chilpélic, which was how he made peace with his brother in the 570s. With that said, his untimely end would be met due to an assassination orchestrated by Chilpélic's wife, Frédégonde. He was assassinated at Vitry-en-Altrois in the north of the Malvangian realm. His death was brutal and sudden, 
as per the norm for enemies of Fledegond. The last brother, Shidpileic, a man despised for his cruelty and savagery by Gligal, and whom he condemns at some length as worse than Herod and Neron, he did have his virtues. For one thing, he was a cultivated man who tried to introduce a Frankish alphabet. He tried to refurbish a great many circuses and amphitheaters throughout Francia, especially ones built by the Romans. He tried to encourage Jews to convert, rather than simply persecuting them. He also tried to support women's rights, repair his fiscal problems, and institute good government. Therefore, he is a man worthy of considerable respect given his intellectual acumen and capabilities, despite his lack of loyalty towards his brother's families. We'll move to his career in 568, when he attempted, after negotiations, to marry a Visigothic princess by the name of Galsuinf, who was the elder sister of Buinho the wife of Sigebao. By these means, he became his brother's brother-in-law. However, once he had her immense dowry, he soon lost interest in her and had her strangled to death in bed and moved on to a new wife, his third one actually, a brilliant lady by the name of Fredegond, whom we'll discuss more at length in our next episode. This murder was one of the many reasons for why Gontran turned upon his brother, and why Sigebel's widow became such an implacable foe of his, as he had murdered her beloved elder sister without any justifications. With Gontran even going so far in 573 to declare that he should be dethroned. And yet, the youngest of Clotel's sons held on to his throne, though it was not without difficulties, as he in 577 faced a rebellion of his own. Nowhere near as complicated as the one in though nowhere near as complicated as the one in the 580s faced by Contran. His was in 577 was, and was by his own son, Merové, who fearful for his life in the face of his stepmother, Fleidigon's hostility, and having been sent to secure Poitiers for his father. Instead, he turned about for Rouen, where he met with his mother, Odoval, seeking her advice and help, as Fleidigon had recently had a son. And on her advice, and with the support of a singular bishop, he opted to marry Brunho, his aunt by marriage, and thus secure himself an alliance against his infuriated father. This new marriage went against the wishes of the church, and was condemned by them as incestuous. However, neither member of the couple cared. With new counselors and with his wife Fleidigond as his chief advisor, Shilpilek would rid himself of all his son's supporters, in fear of being deposed in favor of him. With the bishop who presided over the marriage being exiled and replaced, as to Melevé, he would wage a brief war against his father, who would send an army to Champagne, where he currently was, to claim him. Desperate, he would be intercepted by messengers informing him that the town of Thérouanne favored him, so he fled there, only to be captured. I'm abbreviating a great deal at this point, as the war was a little more interesting than presented here, but lean the list to say it was a trap, and Melevé committed suicide, though it is possible he was actually assassinated by his stepmother, or so Cligal de Toul believed. Given her history, both prior and after 577, and how Cligal seemed to consider it a possibility, I would lean that way. As Melevé was both determined and resourceful, he would have simply given up. Either way, Chilpilek had those who had supported his son punished, and would carry on with his reign, apparently distressed by the loss of his son, whom he had genuinely hoped to reconcile with. This wouldn't be the only son he would bury, with his two sons by Fledigond, Clodobal and Dagobal, dying shortly thereafter. Grief-stricken, mother and father would go mad with sorrow, with the heir to Chilpilek's throne being a boastful young man by the name of Clavis. The younger full brother of Melevé, he would, upon his younger brother's deaths, show himself to be a callous youth, and would, instead of respecting his father's grief, brag and claim that he was now the sole heir. Parading his joy at the lack of competition, he would earn for himself the hatred of his stepmother, who would have him executed on trumped-up charges. Thankfully for Shilpilek's throne, he would have yet another son, born in the summer of 584. This next son would outlive his father, who would order that he be raised in the utmost secrecy, for fear that he perish also, as he had come to believe his prior two sons were assassinated. However, he needn't to have feared for the boy, as he wasn't the target of the next assassination. Shidpilek himself was. Between the 20th and 24th of September, he would be assassinated after seeing his daughter off to marry a Visigothic king. Shilpilek, who was near the city of Shell, was in the middle of a hunt when Falco, one of his servants, approached him with a hidden dagger, only to slash his belly open. Accomplished on the orders of Guinho, the foul murder of Galsuinf had at last been avenged. Join us next time if you wish to properly get to know the two queens who dominated the latter part of the 6th century and what became of Saint-Contran, the second son of Clotel.